Um, Fred, so the last time you were here to do an oral history project was in 20, 2009. Your first book, The Region of Lost Names, had just come out the year before that. Um, you talked to Francisco Aragon about your beginnings as a writer and a reader. As a follow-up to that video, could you tell us three things you learned about yourself as a writer since then? Yes. I mean, I think the, the first thing is because I've been, it just comes back to me a lot lately, is that um, I have to understand that whatever are the things that I'm offered, that they're gifts and I have to accept them. So I write a lot of things that are not me searching for anything or thinking about what someone else will think, but just certain things are offered to me and I accept them. Um, and that's been a huge burden lifted, like it's so freeing, I can't believe it. Because um, then you're just really immediate and close with what it is you're writing, because this thing just was gifted to you. This, mm. It'll come up later, but we were talking about Manuel Perez, I mean, just how his life was gifted to me. The second thing, which is, I think is a continuation of that, is um, I really follow this metaphor by an Icelandic Canadian writer, uh, Christina Gunars, and she talks about the stranger at the door. And what she means is that when we sit down to write in our rooms, we have to lose ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to understand that the person who's going to write isn't actually my biological self. And I have to find ways to invite and even accept the stranger at the door and let him come in. And then whew, it's really, you know, like you get at your your better angel of who you are, probably. Mm -hmm. And that there's a that's what I want to do in writing, as James Salter says, is like discover my better self through the writing, because what's on the page isn't Fred Arroyo. It's something mm. greater than whoever I am. Um, so I'm always kind of remembering that, so I don't get too full of myself, Yeah. Um, which is a difficult thing, uh, a ton of tangential. I don't like to do interviews anymore, because when I do interviews, <laughs> I feel like it gets, a, you know, it, it's a different version that's not a good one. But anyways, I'm going to do my best today. I appreciate being here. And the third thing is, um, it's another form of acceptance, and that is that when I was younger, people would tell me, you know, you're a really beautiful and lyrical writer, mm -hmm. but you don't know how to tell a story. And I had to struggle with that because I was like, I know how to tell a story, but it wasn't the kind of story that they were used to hearing or that they wanted to hear. Yeah. But from that, um, I've accepted that the ultimate thing that will endure, Ezra Pound said that the only thing that endures is emotions. He's probably right, but I want to take that greater, and the only thing that endures is beauty. Mm. So I want to strive as much as I can to use concrete, rather simple, um, yet eloquent language to create beautiful things. And some of that comes with last few interactions with returning back to John Keats his letters, and he has one in his letter where he says, you know, um, that's what I'm searching for is beauty with a capital B. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, and even if I wrote all night and I had in the morning to take my night labors and burn it all up, that would still be good because it was in the service of beauty. And, you know, so another part of that, like, you have to accept your writing and really be immersed in it and work on the beautiful and not worry about where it's going to be published or what anyone's going to think about it. You might even burn it all up in the morning, but whatever you did during that night's labor, it's going to continue with you. Yeah, I love that. I think something for me, I, I agree with people saying that your work is poetic. Um, I found myself very moved by your fiction and your memoir, and there's just like these resonances that you feel in poems that you don't always get in fiction or memoir. Um, it seems to me that you have a very fluid relationship with genre. Um, your prose is as lyrical as any poetry and employs poetic techniques so effortlessly. And your fiction resonates with experiences you describe in your essay collection, Sown in Earth. What Could you define your relationship with genre? And how do you balance narrative with fleeting lyric moments that arise in your work? Um. Yeah, I, um, genre is very important, and yet at the same time, it's 
for me, though, really, it's unimportant. Yeah. And I mean unimportant given, like, what a reader might expect to encounter in particular genres. Mm-hmm. Um, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein writes about family resemblances. Mm-hmm. And he's talking, about, he's talking about language, but he's talking about, like, you can look at a photograph of a family, um, and as you look at that photo, you'll start to see certain resemblances from the people, which will come out, that's a family resemblance. And he says, that's actually how language should work. It's not someone dictating to you what a, a grammar should be or what the rules would be. So he would mean what a genre should be. Mm. Because what we're doing is language games. And so you want to draw from various languages, various rules, various genres to create family resemblances. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Like, you can write a, I can write a prose poem and get it published. And then mm-hmm. I take the prose poem and I turn it a little bit more into narrative. Yeah. And then it becomes a flash fiction in Western Avenue and other fictions. Yeah. Um, or I write a, a lyric essay first, and I think it's going to be this essay, but then I back off and work on it some more and say, nope, I, wanna, I do want to publish this as a prose poem. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a, I think that's a real contemporary thing, that a lot of these genre things actually have to do with what the, the writer says it is. Yeah. And then you send it out. But what you do, of course, is you read a lot in those different genres. Like, I, I really love reading prose poems, and you know they have such a long history, if you mm-hmm. go back and look. Um, but you read all the different genres and you try to figure out what are the key elements between those genres that are always being relied on and then taking those and making that your family resemblance of what you're going to write. And then it's the, it'll come down to the ethical de- decision usually. Um, this is totally free and imaginative and I'm just going to publish it as a fiction. This is, nope, definitely nonfiction and I'm going to publish it as nonfiction. Or I attempted this as nonfiction, but it's not fully, you know? Yeah. There's something I'm, I got to leave that out. Um, I'm not going that way, and I'm going to leave something out. So then I may make it into a fiction. So um, they're not as, I guess, the, real quickly, too, the other part of that is, too, of course, is I'm saying that it's intentional for me. Mm. And that's always been intentional in my work that, when I wrote Sown and Earth, I knew that the only way I could write that book is if I wrote the backstory of what it meant for me to become a writer. Yeah. And then to write that backstory, I had to go back and look at stories that I had written that were autobiographical and rewrite them as nonfiction and put it in the book. Yeah. The question about how do you balance the lyrical and the other. And the narrative. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, but. I believe like all literature is made up of patterns. Yeah. And even though narrative is important, usually the narrative can come about in many different ways than just a chronology or a plot. So most stuff I write is plotless. So I'm always relying on patterns. Mm. Um, And so to create that pattern, I've got to remember that some things can be beautiful, but the pattern won't stick out unless also there's something ugly. Mm. So juxtaposition, you know, comes in in that way. And the big juxtaposition is the relationship between lightness and gravity. Like how you're, I'm writing about heavy things often. Yeah. And so there's a lot of gravity. Like Mm -hmm. how will that person, character escape? Or boy, Fred's going through a lot of emotion Mm -hmm. and it's heavy. And yet then you can put in the beauty in there, the lyricalness, and then there's lightness and you rise above it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, As you were talking about that, I was thinking about the way that your work often has like recurring images and recurring words. Um, As I was going across your your books, I kept noticing them and it would kind of be like these harbingers of mood from one book to the next. Um, You mentioned that writing can be like an angel at the door or it could be like a family resemblance. How, How do you work on like these kind of obsessions that you have um, what are some topics and questions that you feel like your work is circling and kind of obsessed with? Well, if only beauty endures, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I may have to also say that you know only 
all good writing comes out of obsession is the way I say it, yeah. as uh, others have said it. So that's really the only, for me, like that's the only reason to have a writing practice is because you constantly write and over time you'll actually discover what you are obsessing over. Yeah. Um, your writing will let you know yeah. this is what you're working on. But obsession, of course, is important because then that gives it an emotional resonance to it. Mm. Um, because that's almost coming out of the subconscious. It's coming yeah. from some deeper well. Yeah. So obsession like that is um, super important. So when, when these um, kind of obsessions arise, you just lean into them completely? Totally accept them. Yeah. And it's, but it's a little bit of both, so that there's words and hummingbirds and colors that yeah. keep reappearing. Purple. Yeah, and I don't really... Um, there's an intentional thing to that. Purple appeared because I wrote the whole manuscript by hand in purple ink. Oh, wow. Yeah, of another, yeah. Ma a man another manuscript, I wrote it all in blue ink. And did and, the word blue come back? Yeah, and people oh. noticed the blue. Um, and it's trying to do that so that it's not purple or blue, but it does exactly what you say, is it creates an atmosphere and a mood. Yeah. And that's such a hard thing to express, like how do you even capture that? Yeah. But with that level of like doing something intentional, knowing that you want to get into that purple state and all the associations of that, yeah. Um, as well as the obsessions, it will start to like create this resonant layer of like atmosphere mm. and mood that the reader connects to. And then they say, or what people have told me, like when I read, you know, the region of lost name, blue kept appearing, but then it's not blue, blue as we think. It's yeah. like becoming something else. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, uh, what's the, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. Every time you state it, you're moving further away from what it's supposed to signify. Um, so then the reader sees the rose through like the color, but then the sound, a movement, yeah. whatever that is. So I'm always trying to capture that. Oh. And what was the last part of the question? Um, I think it was more about like intentionality, but I got that part. All right, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like your books are just like, like we tell new writers that they should follow their obsessions and mm -hmm. your writing really can, like they're excellent examples of what wonderful things can happen when you do that. Um, I think I would like to talk about memory because it plays such an important role in all of your books. Good, that was the last part, the themes that I've yeah. been writing about. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I think sometimes it's difficult to write down memories because we're always scared that we'll get them wrong or they just won't, they won't be correct. Like we're committed to this factual thing, but um, in your essay collection you write, I'll need to move backward and forward. I'll need to invent the past within the present, the present within the past, if I'm ever to come to terms with this memory. The idea of needing to invent the past within the present, the present within the past is, it's very riveting. It's it acknowledges that memories are colored by how we perceive them in the present. I noticed that to fill in gaps in memory, you use lyrical fragments that act as kind of emotional gestures. Um, what advice would you give to someone who worries they won't capture the past in exact detail? And how do you, how do you take care of yourself as you excavate these kind of traumatic memories? I think an implication of your question, a very good one, complex, and I like how you're using that quote too, thinking about that, is that it's probably not the best way to think that memory is something that you can actually retrieve, mm. you know? Yeah. It's more of a, I say it's like a, it's like a matter. It's, yeah. again, like this is not verifiable, but it's moving through time. It's out there as a force, mm. but how do I get connected to it? Yeah. Um, so I can never, in other words, I can never capture the truth of a memory. Yeah. But what are, what is the reason that certain memories keep coming back? And why do they keep coming back so vividly and sensually? Yeah. As if they're calling for you to pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, so my more like uh, craft level process answer would be, and maybe this is just too academic, but questions like that come about and I, do a workshop sometimes when people read the book and there's a group for writers and I just you know say that when I wrote the book what I would do was I didn't worry about the chronology 
and I only worried about what memory came back to me. And then mm -hmm. what I did was I wrote every first draft of any of those essays. I tried to write them as much as I could in 500 words or less. Wow. Because by doing that limit, I just made each of them vivid and lyrical mm -hmm. um, for the most part. And um, I feel like I got to the kernel of it, like what was actually there. But then I'd have to step back and intentionally look at it and say, but this isn't effective. That 500 words is limiting because there's this little fragment that needs more, this one that needs more. Yeah. Um, so by doing that, though, I wasn't writing the truth of memory. I was really artistically creating it yeah. and putting a limit on it to just create these little snapshots. Um, so that's one suggestion I always make because then all of a sudden you're already in the, the process of seeing, nope, I'm going to make something out of memory. Mm. And it's not just going to be memory, you know, yeah. with a capital M. The yeah. traumatic part is difficult for me because I know this sounds shocking, but it's like it's a little bit part of what made me uncomfortable about doing the interview is that um, there is so much that I don't understand whether it's subconscious or conscious in a way. Mm. And I don't and I don't like to spend time messing with that. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm afraid, like if you look too hard at those kind of things, it could be possible that you would kill the thing that you're trying to write. Yeah, for sure. Um, Nietzsche said that you know you could actually an artist could actually kill themselves. Wow. They couldn't complete a novel because they would look into the abyss of what they were trying to do and realize I'm not going <laughs> to make it. Um, so what I'm the reason I'm bringing that up though is because. I wrote that book and the word trauma never came into my mind. Mm. I didn't think about my, my relationship with my dad as traumatic. Mm. I thought about it as like, somehow I was able to escape all that stuff, but I was able to escape it in a way in which I wasn't going to make fun of it. I wasn't going to look down upon it, but I had to look inside of it and find the powerful threads that helped me to become who I am. And I just thought that f perhaps for younger Latinos, especially first generation students who come from similar backgrounds, if they heard that story, then they would understand better the value and power of their origin story. So I never thought of it as traumatic. Mm. And then that's just weird. Uh, just as much as like sometimes I don't realize I'm using the word blue all the time. Yeah. Or in the new book of poems, I was using the word pewter all the time. Mm. And then another poet kind of caught that. It's, it's part of your hallmark. You do obsessive things like that, but then it kind of becomes too much. So um, when people now tell me about the book being traumatic, I see it in a totally new way. And I agree and understand what they're saying. But like in the writing of it, even stepping out and going through final revisions, I really didn't think of it in that way. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's part of it. Um, you want to be as open as possible to what you're writing about. And in so doing, um, you're excavating it. Sometimes it will make you weep. Sometimes it'll make you very sad. Um, but don't see that as a negative thing, but see it as the work is being powerful. Yeah. Um, offering you something. You, you probably remember that uh, I don't remember which book it was, but Charles Dickinson was writing uh, what I, you know, one of the books. I don't think it was Christmas Carol, David Copperfield. He, he talked about him when he was writing it. He started weeping like crazy. Mm. And um, people tell you if you cry over, if you weep over what you're writing, then you should throw it away. I think that's totally erroneous. Yeah. You know, some, you're writing, and if something makes you weep, that means that perhaps the ineffable has entered into you. Yeah. Your language is starting to fail you and your emotion is overtaking. Yeah. And I appreciate your question that that can be hard, but that's something to accept. Yeah. Um, I mean, Robert Frost says, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Yes. So I totally get that. And I'm surprised that folks would say that you would have to throw it away after you've wept over it. Um, you've unlocked something that even surprised you and shook you to your emotional core. Um, and part of the, right, and part of that is the um, 
oh, your lyricism is just too over-emotional. Or what you've written about is too mm. over-emotional. Or what you've written is sentimental. Mm. Right? And yeah. these are... I just follow that. Again, it's a Jim Harrison quote, you know, like, um, I would rather explore and dive into the depths of the human heart and be called a sentimentalist than be a pointy-headed intellectual. I love that. You know, oh. so sentiment is important, it's especially in the time in which we live in. Mm. Because so many of our emotions are, we learn, are historically, culturally, and ideologically constructed. Mm. So we have big swaths of America who don't know how to feel about things. Yeah. Um, we don't understand certain kinds of rage. Yeah. Um, we're st still struggling with, are we really, are we really being empathetic to, for example, like, do we have empathy for the people who are right now gathering in the border? Yeah. Um, all these kind of things. We say we're empathetic, right? And yeah. we want our country to be diverse. Mm -hmm. And yet, it might not be a true emotion yet for some people. Yeah. It's just following an idea of like, what political correctness or however you yeah. want to phrase that. And I think it's important as writers for us to give people language to feel and empathize. Exactly. Maybe our stories can help them to reinvent how they feel. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, I think I'd like to talk to you about your in-progress poetry manuscript as sure. we're talking about poetry and creating language. Um, I'm actually surprised that poetry wasn't like your first genre that you wrote in because everything feels so informed by like the poetic turn. Um, You've mentioned Jim Harrison, but what are who are some other writers that have influenced the writing of your poetry manuscript? During the main part, it was Jim Harrison and it was Mary Oliver. Mm. Uh, she, she was amazing. Her book uh, of essays, Upstream. Oh yeah. But then I read a lot so of her. Good. <laughs> yeah, so good. Um, a lot of her poetry, of course. Uh, there was a big collection I read too as well and I kept going back to it and reading it more than once. Also the French writer René Char. Mm. Um, he writes these works that it's difficult to see. Is that a prose poem or is that an essay? Oh, that's uh, so cool. Um, he was in the resistance. Mm. So it's like he kind of puts at certain poems like a layer over, of mystery over it because he cannot give away people, it would have repercussions. Mm -hmm. They had to do a lot of, you know, violent things. He's from France, uh, was out in the woods a lot in nature, but I really love his poems. Um, even though I don't fully understand them, I really like his poems. And then um, the, po the English poet John Clare, mm -hmm. as well as Cates, but John Clare especially. I was thinking about a question like this and some of the other questions too. I always have this saying that um, try not to listen to the list of books that people tell you you should read or the book that they just yeah. read, what they just think is great. Like they think because they just read it, you got to read it now. You might, but you're in the middle of something and you may not get to it. But yeah. Maybe you buy it and you put it away. But really, the best books are the books that find us in just the moment in which we need them. Mm. So um, I have a poet friend who has read every book that I've written. He's usually the first reader, and he's never critical. He, is, he, he taught me so much about accepting, because everything he says is like, this is great. But because he's an editor, he'll you know, do some suggestions. Um, but he said many years ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago, you have to read this biography um, on John Clare. Mm. He goes, I just really feel if you read this biography, you will really identify with him. And um, I didn't, yeah, I'm going to. And then I just went away, went away, went away. And then I was in used bookstore in North Carolina. I saw a beautiful copy of it and I bought it and I read it. Almost 700 pages and I was amazed. He was he's such a great poet. Um, and his poetry was just, uh, 
he was come from like an illiterate family. Mm -hmm. He didn't get to go to school. Yeah. But he had a little stool next to the stove with the stovepipe going through the the the, the roof made out of thatch. Yeah. Um, which had a hole, and he would that would be his light where it fell through the hole, mm -hmm. and he would sit there with books and read constantly, and the rain would hit him, and he'd keep reading. And then when he got older, he'd do all these walks. It was before the English. Um, enacted the Closure Act, where they took away the fields from the common people and people owned them and put fences around them. So he used to be free to walk all over. And in his hat, because they didn't have paper, he would find any kind of scrap piece of paper that he could find, and he'd put it inside his hat, and he'd walk, and when the poem came up, he would take down the hat and put it on top of the hat and write the poem right on the spot. And he's, when they asked him about his poetry, he said, Basically, it was like, I didn't make the poems, I found them in the fields. Yeah. And it was just like, wow. I was thinking about that quote as you we were, were talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the class earlier, you talked about how you write in nature, and I kept thinking about that John Clare quote as you were talking about that. I was like, it does feel that way sometimes, like the poem arrives while we're walking or meandering. So you knew that quote. I did, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, could you actually read Alba Blanca? Sure, us? I'd love to. <clears throat> There's a couple where I do the translation, so White Dawn, but mm. I didn't want to do it for this one. I just wanted it to be Alba Blanca. My father hardly ever said a word to me. He held his language, his family, his lovely garden so close to his rolled up sleeves so tight within his fists that words, I thought, must be terrible, so painful he never wanted to mouth them, only wanted to strike them, never wanted to release them, like the white butterflies fluttering between his pumpkin blossoms and green rosemary, never wanted to inflict them, like the leather strap he took from a rusty nail on a post in the kitchen to quiet my questions, my eager and loud talking, my childhood singing. Later, in a dream, I found my father sitting on a wrought iron bench in the park of pigeons. There was a blue fountain pen, the nib a shiny fine gold, a note card streaked with pigeon shit, the words elegant, illegible purple lines like waves searching for a shore. The shadows of palms tiger-striped his open hands, his thighs, the freshly picked tomatoes ripening in a circle in front of his shoes, powdered with red dust. Decades passed. There was no time left to blame or forgive. I loved the smell of old leather, his brown face streaked with salt, waves. He wiped his eyes, opened his mouth, we both looked to the sky as the pigeons sprang up and whirled in the alabaster light. I love that poem so much. Um, I'm just, the garden appears in your essay collection as well, but I find myself very moved by the way that you write masculinity in men. It seems to me that you're intentional about how you untangle men from their work to give a fuller picture of their personhood. Your attention often focuses on describing or revealing moments of tenderness and vulnerability. Um, to bring up Mary Oliver again, she said, attention is the beginning of devotion. Is curiosity a factor in how you approach writing men, and particularly your father? Like, do you want a better understanding of them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there's like these missing parts, these holes. But I love that Mary Oliver co quote, you know, yeah, that attention, curiosity is everything. Mm -hmm. And it can lead to devotion. Um, so everything, once I got old enough to understand what the culture was telling me, what education was telling me, it was telling me that there was no way anyone should have any devotion towards a man like my father. Mm. Um, you should probably forget about them. Um, they don't deserve to have any story. So, um, but, I saw, but I thought like, but how is that the case? Like, why does it have to be that way? 
Um, especially when I just started to think about how most people, there's a lot of people who never have any encounters with Latino men. Mm -hmm. And when they do, or maybe the reason they don't is because they already have views about who these people are. Um, they're others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they're bad, they're deviant. Um, what are you, know, all these kind of things, you know? Um, and that's especially for me because Puerto Rico is, you know, basically a colony of the United States. So it causes a lot of animosity because people don't understand that my father is an American citizen, but they still see, you know, as like we're immigrants and maybe we don't belong here. But we were part of America from the very beginning. We were mm -hmm. the first place. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of look at that and like move beyond the surface and try to get, as in all my work, the emotional truths. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, you got to pay attention to it. You have to have a lot of curiosity. Um, delve into it and then see what you discover to have that emotional truth. Because in a way, I was also just following that whole thing is that, and we were talking about this at dinner, you turn 18 or 19 and you feel like you're invis invincible. Mm -hmm. you, you are idealizing who you are as an individual and you're gonna go out in the world and make it on your own. And although we say family is important in America, we usually don't mean that. We mean that family is important to a certain point, but then when you turn 18, 22, or whatever, you need to go out on your own yeah. and do your own thing. Um, so I just started to look at that and say, but if I take that, then that means I got to forget about all that before, and there's got to be more there than that. Because it's so, it's so foundational, like my last name, yeah. <laughs> the experiences that I did have, and little things like photographs of me as a child, being in Puerto Rico, my, you know, and the whole thing, my dad being proud to take me there yeah. as the first grandson. Photographs of me and him together, and they, they were just totally different than the things that I was remembering mm -hmm. um, that were closer, you know, to my age. Um, which was just that terror, you know, that he just went through a very difficult time that all collided or coincided with me being in high school and turning 17 to go out on my own. So there was just, this, when I left, it was like I had no relationship with him. And writing helped to maybe create a, another family resemblance yeah. to uh, try to figure that out. I will say too that the, um, because Puerto Rico is an island, there was a point in my life where I read this book by, since we're here at Notre Dame, an Irish writer named Frank O'Connor, and the book's called The Lonely Voice, A Study of Modern Fiction. And when he wrote this book in the early 20th century, he was making the distinction between a lyric poem and a short story because he believed they were the two supreme genres, like the most difficult things to write. But of course he wanted to go over onto the side of the short story and part of that reason was because at the beginning of the 20th century when culture and time and experience was speeding up so fast, he was seeing that um, a lot of people aren't gonna wanna take the time and attention or devotion to read a novel. Mm. But a short story by definition is something you can read in one sitting. So if you can write really good short stories, that can you know, really affect readers. So he saw this as this great thing but he said, but the difference is now that when we write these stories, we no longer have to write about kings and queens or princesses and princes. We have to look around in our culture and see that there are submerged populations. Mm. These populations that are just be submerged by the myths that are circulating, the language that's being circulated, the history. And he says, so I'm gonna write stories about washerwomen people who sw sweep the streets. And then as soon as I read that, I just, you know, yeah. and Ireland itself being a submerged population because it's colonized by Britain, I just started thinking about that and I was like, oh, that's kind of my experience uh, in America. Sometimes yeah. it really feels like you're just a submerged population. So how can you bring that out of the depths? Yeah, I mean, it makes me think about like your idea of the region of lost names, mm -hmm. these people who reside in the region of lost names, 
Like you come to the US, you get a nickname, and then where does it go from there? I think you also explore in your work what happens when a name is revealed, like Manuel Perez. Um, actually, I want you to talk a little bit more about the characters. So like in the region of Lost Names and in Western Avenue, Boogaloo and the other characters from the region of Lost Names reappear in these short stories. I know we talked about it last night, but um, I was actually going to ask if the characters would come about in the future, but you told us that in the book of Manuel's, Manuel Perez is going to come back in some way. Could you talk a little bit about that book and that project? Sure. Um, real quickly, I also hear a little bit in your question, too, and this interests me. It's like a thread yeah. going through, if it's OK. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you read the region of lost names, and you, you, understood, you, you just articulated, well, he moves from his nickname to Manuel to being Manuel Perez, yeah. and he's so foundational to the book. Yeah. Even though he dies in the very first couple of pages. Yeah. Well, he's Magdalene's um, father, mm -hmm. and she doesn't know. When I wrote multiple drafts of that novel, Magdalene was not a Latina. Mm -hmm. She was an idea of just this young girl that I needed to have like a mirror or foil to Ernest. Yeah. And um, but what, she was part Swedish, <laughs> just Caucasian. Um, and then I was writing the final draft of the novel, well, the penultimate draft of the novel. There's a pesky fly in here listening. And I uh, <laughs> was in Northern California, out isolated. And I was working. And it was going well. But one night, I, I would write a lot. And in the evening, I would just mellow out and just think about what I had done that day and get ready for the next day. And that night, out of nowhere, Magdalene started to speak to me. Wow. And she just started telling me some stuff. And one of the things she told me was, she revealed to me that Boogaloo was her father. Mm. And it was like a seeker in the book that I didn't understand. Yeah. But in revealing that, then I was like, oh, she's Latina. She's Puerto Rican. Oh, and then like, oh, the whole book just fell together. It was amazing. Um, so I'm always working with that, like waiting and listening. If the character comes back to me, then why should I just let them die in some other book? I yeah. can use my imagination and try to bring them back. Oh, I see. Um, so all of this was a big question then, because who was Boogaloo? Mm. There was a guy called Boogaloo. Boogaloo is also like a really important uh, form of Puerto Rican salsa, mm. its own like little genre. And then there was a dance, let's do the Boogaloo. Um, but there was a guy, Boogaloo. And, um, but in my writing, he just became a composite of many men. Yeah. Uh, every man. And then so that's probably why I just told Manuel Perez. I like the sound of the name, but Manuel is such a common name. Mm -hmm. So I started doing, I got done with an essay that I did not include in Sown in Earth after writing about Boogaloo Manuel Perez several times, was an essay that I just had this title like, Who is Boogaloo? And I wanted to write an yeah. essay about that because I thought I would, and I did a draft, because it has so much to do with the creative process, like how do we come up with a character? It isn't just all autobiographical. It's not just based on a person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not just a figment of your imagination or a work of your imagination. But I didn't do that, but I still had this lingering question, like why did you keep writing about this person and how did you come up with that name? Mm -hmm. So then I started doing research and I came up with multiple Manuel Perez's saw how kind of common the name is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because Perez is like one of the oldest names in all of civilization life. Yeah. It starts with, you know, it starts in, with Jewish people and gets over to Portugal and Spain, then comes to the New World. But there was a Manuel Perez who was a jazz musician at the turn of the century. And his identity was difficult to trace who he was. And there wasn't a lot written about him. So that drew me into a new version of, I wanted to write about him, but I had all these stories where the metaphor that I'm working with is uh, the character appears who's Manuel, mm -hmm. but they're not always the same Manuel. Or 
it's called the book of manuals. So in certain stories, a book or a manual mm -hmm. is the key element. And then I was going back to the ancient name of, before we had e Manuel, was Emmanuel, which means, uh, you know, t it's religious to see, to have clarity. And so I wanted to use that as a lens to write about working class men. Yeah. Um, and have us see them again, because going back again to the emotion, because we don't see them and then we don't feel for them at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's a, it's go, it keeps going kind of all in different ways because different manuals keep appearing. I think I've, I've written about 16 stories and published maybe 12 of them already. Oh, wow. And so I imagine maybe writing 21 total. Yeah. But I don't know yet, so I'm going to have to see. Because um, I have another work where, um, that I imagine in this book, but maybe it'll be a novella at the end unless it becomes its own novel, but um, there's a character who I've named Alba. Mm. And this young woman, her father was Manuel. And it just, it keeps growing and I'm discovering a lot of great things about it. And I chose the name Alba because it came out of the poetry manuscript, but in a way she's, a, she's another version of Magdalene. Yeah. So these characters do appear. I will just, end that with just saying the thing that I didn't say is that every time I finish a book I always have a question of whether I've done whenever I finish those first two books each time I had a question of whether or not I did uh, Boogaloo or Manuel Perez justice mm -hmm. like I just felt that there was something lingering yeah. that I could have done so in a way even though those were two works of fiction based on this made up character yeah. Um, that kind of what drew me to write about my father a lot. Yeah. Because I saw that he was a version of Boogaloo. Yeah. So then I was like, okay, we'll do it in the, you know, the real way. <laughs> the experience, let's see what happens. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I think it's interesting that Alba has become like this new thing for you, this new character to explore. Um, but with with the new collection, the Book of Manuel's, so you're you're exploring like the jazz musician, but who are some of the other Manuel's that you've looked into or been writing about? Um, most of them, they're, so they're not just they're not Manuel's. I mean, they're not like a, yeah. a Manuel in history. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but they have that name. Mm. There's a, a whole bunch of father and son stories. Mm. Um, and uh, it has a lot to do with a Manuel who has now moved from like a working class background to having some sense of doing better financially. Yeah. But um, these stories keep appearing where um, he's separated from the boy's mother and mm -hmm. he has these different moments with the son and they have a lot to do with uh, fathers and sons. Oh, I see. What's being passed down. Yeah. Uh, what the narrator can or cannot pass down. Mm. Um, a lot of them have to do with the, uh, if a story is about the ability of the character telling their story, mm. a lot of the stories have to do about these Manuel's not having the ability to tell their story. Yeah. It's about the inability of telling that story. Yeah. Um, so there's a, and there's, so there's a lot of stories too that are kind of like travel stories. Yeah. They have a migration in them inside the United States yeah. because these manuals have to go to state, different states to work. Yeah. Um, at dinner, you were talking about how specifically, like with Manuel Perez, you were doing research. Mm -hmm. Has, have you gone anywhere else to like research the book besides New Orleans? No, just New Orleans. Yeah. Um, which has taken, well, I, should, I have to say this humbly. I, re I recently wrote a story which I feel is like the best, um, one of the best things I've ever written in my life. It's set That's awesome. In, and it's, set, <laughs> it's set in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, and I made it a total new Manuel Perez. Um, it's a Manuel Perez from Cuba and this, mm. uh, who came and this narrator's trying to tell his father's story. And uh, I was able to take a draft of a, 
creative nonfiction essay I wrote, yeah. and then also take that poem work song from the poetry manuscript, and I was all able to weave them together in this yeah. fiction. And it just came out really good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, awesome, though. Um, the other research, though, would be that um, going to Montana, I, I go to Mont not a lot. I've, been, I've went quite a bit in the last decade. And I go to this particular place, and there's an immigrant mountain, mm -hmm. and there's an immigrant creek. But then there's creeks everywhere. And, you know, that last time was a week, and every morning I'd get it. It'd get like 90 in the day. Yeah. But not as hot, but really warm. But at night it was still getting down to 40s, one night 30 something. So I'd get up in the morning, it was freezing, but I'd go <laughs> to my coffee and just start writing. And the hummingbirds would come to the feeder, mm -hmm. and the creek would just be out there, it was so loud. Yeah. And um, that helped me to write the poems. But then I took, uh, for instance, that poem, Simple Music, mm -hmm. and I just took the framework of that, and I wrote a really big uh, story as well, which is a story um, of a Manuel who's writing a letter to someone who's not named, so it, and it has 10 parts. Yeah. Um, and it's called The Wind Through the Pines mm -hmm. on writing. And it does this weird thing where it's a fiction but, and it's presented as yeah. letters, but it has a whole bunch of stuff about writing because that's who this person is. Yeah. And so Montana's come into it in some ways as well. Oh, that's cool. So it's also, so the story is also kind of like a manual for writing? Yes. <laughs> That's so interesting. Which, to go back to some of our further questions who I left out, but this is mm -hmm. unavoidable. Another poet, of course, who, it's great that we're here at Notre Dame in a way, that was is important that helped me with this last manuscript is uh, Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton. Uh, and his, the monastery he was at is not far from where I live in Tennessee. It's up in Kentucky. And uh, I just love his writing. Um, have you ever? I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with his work. And he's a great poet. Um, but he writes about solitude, spirituality, mm -hmm. listening to silence. And he has a line that says, um, there is nothing that a poem can accomplish that has not already been done so with the wind blowing through the pines. Oh. And that's where the title for, yeah. wow. And it was a, just another John Clare moment, yeah. in a way, you know? It's like that, it arrived to you. Yeah. Like the angel at the door moment. Yeah. The wind itself just going through the pines is a poem. Yeah, it is. You know, and... Um, I think I had another question. So with the, with the story that you wrote that you feel like is your best, yeah. it seems like with a lot of your work, you have that question at the end where... It's like, have I done justice to that character? In that story, do you feel like that's, like you've done justice to the character or what makes it feel like the best kind of? <laughs> I feel like you're trying to get closer to something. Are you getting closer to achieving like the justice that you want for a character in that story? Yes, but in this case, it's a different thing. Mm. Um, and what I mean by different is, yeah. um, it has to do with the writing itself. Mm. Um, going back to genre, just stripping away any kind of sense of genre, that it doesn't have to be this specific thing and just to get the story. Yeah. Um, and is it a report? Is it a series of incidents? Is it pages from a manual? So. Um, for the last two years, I've been, because I was finishing the book of poems, I was reading this Australian writer. His name is Gerald Murnane. And he's written these books that are just amazing. And you read them, and his, his dream is to live in a house of books. And he has so many books that some of the yeah. books he has to, he puts them in black garbage bags and puts them up in the rafters just so they will be there. Yeah. Um, so he's a voracious reader, but he was a teacher of creative writing for a long time. People thought he was going to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Yeah. Um, and his, his 
his work, which is published as fiction, is basically ungeneralizable. It's really <laughs> difficult to understand. You know, you can't say that it. It's really like he's using Borges's notion, and I guess this is what I'm doing too. I could have mentioned, but you know, Borges's fictiones. Mm. He calls the book fictions, fictiones, but you read them, and some are like essays, philosophical meditations. He's like, you know, everything is a fiction. Um, and Murnane takes that to a really extreme and beautiful thing. It's amazing. Um, a book, a book uh, Last Letter to My Reader, where he writes this book and he, he talks about every book that he wrote and why and what was going on. And it's just, it's extremely beautiful. My, a, a History of Books is another one. Um, so I took that and was able to strip it down. Like, how do you find that voice? Because if you can get rid of genre and you can really discover, get too close to your voice, what we're talking about is no hesitation in the writing. Yeah. We're talking about your authority. Yeah. And so he has that. And so I tried to do this in this new story. Oh, I see. Um, I mean, that's a really beautiful thing. I think as writers, we're always trying to get to that. Yeah. And we're always struggling over hesitancy in writing. Um, on the page, do, does his work look like poems, or does it look like essays, or just all of it? <laughs> Is it lineated at all? It's, it's usually like page after page of giant paragraphs. Oh, wow. You know? Wow. Uh, he goes, just goes on and breaks it. That's fascinating. <laughs> I'll definitely have to try to so read his work. But and even though it's that way, it's still fragmented, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. And what he's writing about, which is like, um, it's like he's, a, he's, it's like he's somewhere in the, the sky, but it's all in his mind, where he's imagining like, what is this region of Australia that he's writing? Yeah. And he goes back. It's called the plains. And it's all these people who originally came and built these farms and lived yeah. these real insular lives and grew cattle, but like how his family was. Uh, his father was a big horse gambler. So there's all this great <laughs> horse racing in, uh, uh, in Australia. So he was all involved with horse racing. So as a little boy, he's playing with marbles. And he creates his own racetrack, another miniature world. And with these marbles, he does, <laughs> with all these colors, he does yeah. all the horses. Then when he gets older as a writer, he invents his own horse racing game and does all the colors on the jockeys. And those colors mean very specific things. And he invented an island off Australia where a whole bunch of things like this happened. And he never wrote those books yet. All that material is in these giant um, filing cabinets. Yeah. And he says, when I die, what you're going to find is what's more interesting is whatever the things are in my filing cabinet. So um, I guess if we're going to take this thing about genre further, well, you, you know, your yeah. really good question is that, like, I don't really like to be called an author. You know, mm. and people will say, well, you deserve that. And I'm like, no. I even sometimes don't even like to be called a writer. I just think that it's more to the verb of it, you know, to write, yeah. just to be writing. Mm. And Renee kind of seems to share that. Yeah. I really love things that are very fluid in genre. Like, they get me excited about, like, what we can do in writing. Um, so. What is possible. What is rather, possible. Yeah. yeah. And also, it helps me consider what failures there are in language mm -hmm. and what language cannot capture. Um, I really appreciate having this conversation with you, and I'm really excited about um, the Book of Manuel's. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the great questions. That was a wonderful conversation. Yeah.